Hey there folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And today we're going to be talking about the newest album from Blood Orange called Freetown Sound. But first, let's talk about sex. Specifically what one would consider sexy within the context of music. And unsurprisingly, there's a range when it comes to this sort of thing. What one person might consider sexy or racy or even kinky, another might consider tedious or overdone or even offensive. And of course, these ideas tend to evolve over time. But if you want to flip to an instantly recognizable period when sexy music was more dominant in the popular conscience, an easy place to start would be 80s pop and R&B. This is the era of Prince and Madonna. Donna, artists testing limits of explicit content and good taste, but doing it enough sensuality and tightness to make some killer music out of it before the 90s hammered most of that into the brick wall. I might like grunge, adult alternative, punk, and gangster rap, but most of it wouldn't fall into what the popular unconscious considers sexier music. And as such, if you're on the fringe of R&B in the modern era, it tends to be an easy instrumental shorthand to call back to the 1980s, which was the first big impression I got from Blood Orange, the stage name for Devontae Hines. Now, he's He's been around the indie scene for well over a decade, starting after his band Test Icicles with a few indie folk records on his own under the even more ridiculous name Lightspeed Champion. But in 2011, he'd reinvent himself as a smoother R&B crooner trying to blend in liquid indie rock guitar tones with the type beats you remember from a guy like Prince. And yet, I've never really been quite impressed with him. Instrumentally, he gets most of the way there, even if I do think the tones aren't quite as tight and strong as they could be, but Heinz himself never really impressed me as a singer. Hate to say it, but he's nowhere near close to matching his instrumentation when it comes to personality. Less Prince than El DeBarge or maybe even Eddie Murphy. And that's a problem when the writing isn't particularly interesting either, especially on that first album. So for his follow-up, he called in all his indie connections for an even more lavish slice of 80s revival music on Cupid Deluxe in 2013, and yet somehow it was even worse. Maybe it's my fault for listening to Prince after he passed away a couple months ago and then coming back to this album expecting something with tightness or greater punch in the melodies to build to a real hook or a vocal performance to make any impact at all, or guest performances that remotely fit with the style of music, but this record fell incredibly flat for me. And yeah, I can appreciate the exploration of queer themes, but they sure as hell deserve better presentation than this. I might have issues when the weekend pulls from this era, but he can at least get the groove and atmosphere in the instrumentation in this material a lot better. But it did not look like Blood Orange was done just yet, so out of nowhere he dropped a full surprise album called Freetown Sound, which following the grand 80s tradition of R&B went straight into political material. And immediately, I had some justifiable concerns. I can point to a string of bad political albums and songs out of the mid to late 80s and a lot fewer success stories. Then also because of his guest stars to help define his black queer vision, he pulls on icons of that community like Carly Rae Jepsen, lead singer of Blondie, Debbie Harry, and Nelly Furtado. Okay, yeah, you know what, that's not fair. He's worked with Carly Rae Jepsen before, and he's also got Zuri Marley, spoken word artist Tanahishi Coates, slam poet Ashley Hayes. But as someone who really hasn't liked the last two Blood Orange records or their attempts at sensuality, I didn't really have high expectations here. But that only means it could get better, right? So what do we get with Freetown Sound? Ugh, I don't know. I, I know this review is not gonna be popular because yes, well, I will say that Freetown sound is better than Cupid Deluxe, probably his best album under the Blood Orange name, I'm still not much of a fan of this. And no, it's not because of the subject matter or themes, most of which I find fascinating and fairly well articulated, but it's an issue that's been persistent for Blood Orange's entire run of R&B. The music itself isn't all that interesting or well constructed. The sort of half-formed 80s R&B revivalism that doesn't seem to have half the punch and swell of the best of that genre. And look, I get the increased focus on lyrics and ideas in reviews of the this album. I mean, come on, it's me here. But there's a big difference between highlighting these for greater focus and emphasis and ignoring musical missteps because you like the message or you want to be seen as progressive. Especially when Heinz himself has said that this record isn't quite as political as many have thought or emphasized. So yeah, that's a lot to unpack and defend here. So let's start off with the content and what he's trying to say here. And almost intentionally, it doesn't seem to have a defined narrative through line. More scattershot and half-formed with returning motifs and ideas surrounding and queer and black identity fading in and out. And very quickly, it becomes clear that Heinz himself isn't looking to make a coherent point surrounding this identity, more focused on how that identity is defined, whether it be from others or coming from within. If anything, he's more concerned about people being honest about the image and definition of themselves rather than the content of that identity, or at the very least knowing the history behind that image. If a white girl's gonna wear braids and a thug life shirt to a music festival and then completely ignore the roots of black culture and the real struggles of the community, 
like on chance, it'd be better if she at least understood the historical context behind it all. But what I find interesting about this album is that Heinz can at least acknowledge that for as much as we'd like to define our own identities on our own, on some level, we're still conscious of how other people view us, and that can impact how we behave and present ourselves, even if we want to limit that. There's a running lyrical motif of, you chose to fade away with him, I chose to try and let you in. Showing the alternative paths of assimilation to the norm versus exposing who you truly are and perhaps going alone. And when you have songs like Better Than Me, where he feels an odd jealousy for not fitting more easily into those strident causes, not feeling black enough, not feeling queer enough, there's real nuance there. I can appreciate that. But of course, all this is wrapped up in what you would normally expect for a modern R&B album. And I'll say it's definitely a bit of an odd fit when you have these types of identity politics placed adjacent up to more conventional relationship or hookup jams, along with a load of religious subtext that feels far more scattershot than it should be like on Augustine. He's not quite pulling off what D'Angelo did with Black Messiah. It doesn't quite blend as well. Arguably the biggest example of this content mishmash is Hands Up, where the hook seems to focus on police brutality, and yet the verses paint a failing relationship where it seems like this girl is trying to save her lover from that fear. After all, she's not the only one in the world, and she's being called out for that. And But even there, the connections are pretty tenuous, and I have to wonder how much more impact this album could have if it actually had focus, or could merge its scattershot musings into a cohesive point. As much as I like the chop up samples of Tom Nahisi Coates, or Ashley Hayes, or Venus Extravaganza on Black, or Feminist, or Trans Identity, I find they're all taking more of an actual stand and cohesive point than Heinz himself can assemble. And while they aren't as glaringly out of place as the rap verses, or Dave Longstress' awful stab at solo on Cupid Deluxe, they can feel a little bit distracting here. They don't quite blend together. And all this could have been helped if the vocal performances had more defined identity themselves, especially from Devontae Hines. It's clear he idolizes artists like Prince and Michael Jackson, but he's never brought that level of rawness, tightness, and passion in his delivery that was so gripping about them. Now, he fits a little bit better against the smoother tones against the synth funk of his last two albums, but I'm not exactly enthused by his quivering stabs at soulful R&B, mostly because they feel kind of inconsistent for me. I actually really like the opening multi-track vocals on By Ourselves, but that level of contemporary R&B harmonization doesn't really show up more on this album. And more often than not, again, Heinz often places himself in a secondary role behind his female guest stars when he's not drowning himself in reverb or dropping into a baritone that really doesn't impress me all that much. Take Empress Of on Best of You or Zuri Marley on Love Ya or especially Nelly Furtado on Hadron Collider, which might well be one of my favorite songs here for its ethereal vibe and a vocal melody that reminded me a little bit of Sharon Denadel of Within Temptation of all people. And yeah, should mention Carly Rae Jepsen on Better Than Me. She also sounds pretty damn great, but I can't be the only one who found her more subtle delivery worked far better on her last album with Heinz with emotion than on this record here. But then we have the instrumentation and production, most of which draws from the smoother, more liquid R&B tones that span the time frame between early 80s funk and the easy listening material that tends to get forgotten for the rest of the decade, as it should. Because I'll be blunt, the sound has never gripped me all that much, then or now. I hate to say it, but I don't have a lot of nostalgia for the glory days of Lionel Richie or MJ's more saccharine ballads, and that's what a lot of the down-tempo material brings out to me, with sparse percussion and even sparser melodies that can't help but feel unfinished at points. Now, that's not saying that Heinz isn't a gifted melodic composer when he wants to be. His time working with other pop artists has given him more of an inclination towards pop sounds, and has led to better hooks on tracks like the spacious piano-touched Augustine, or the more bass-driven Hands Up, or the obvious MJ pastiche of But You that treads right up to the line of corniness with that hook and kind of goes over it. And you know what? There are definitely points where Heinz gets there more creative instrumentally, with the ragged rattles of percussion and bass and flutters a muted melody with the cello on Best of You, or the mournful calls of sax that flesh out the sound on With You, or Love Ya, or Squash Squash, or the tinkling pianos in the vast space of Hadron Collider, or the beautiful interlude on I Know. But many of these instrumental ideas, just like a lot of the writing, they feel far more scattershot than they really do. And while they do flow together reasonably well, this is an instrumentally cohesive record in terms of its sound, it can help but feel a little bit indulgent when they don't really have a lot of payoff. And that's not counting my consistent dislike for Heinz's 
awful synth choices from the garish spurts against the otherwise slick funk of EVP or the blurry four note drone on the verses of better than me or the oily tones and I know which doesn't contrast well with the piano at all or the off-key aerial pink-esque haze of Desiree that often just feels slapdash or the tinny fragments that spark through the opening juicy one to four and don't fit at all especially when that bass guitar actually does build more punch and that's where we get to the closer better numb which is fragmented acoustic guitar at the beginning and the off-key synth drone that breaks into a series of chopped up samples that just don't coalesce into anything at all it's a real poor way to end the album at least for me but in short Look, I get why people like this record. I can definitely make the argument that it's not for me, and there will definitely be an audience that will relate to the subject matter a lot more strongly, especially if you can get behind the lyrics in some spots. But again, it's the music that's been the consistent letdown of Blood Orange for me. An 80s pastiche that doesn't have the sense of scale, explosive tightness, or the power of the R&B I sold that I liked from that decade. If you put him back in the 80s, I don't think he would get the same praise he's getting now. And when you couple it with the lack of lyrical cohesion and instrumental indulgence, it can really make this album feel like a slog to listen to through. That said, there is enough nuance to the themes and enough agreeable hooks and tones on this record that I can like it and mostly respect it without really loving it. So I'm giving it a light 6 out of 10 and really only a recommendation if you're a big fan of the quieter side of 80s R&B. Otherwise, I guess I can see what some people might find sexy about this, but I don't think it's for me. So yeah, I'd probably skip it. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. I can imagine this point that I have with this record is kind of controversial. I understand why a lot of people like it. I don't really. But hey, I've got the poll up there, so you guys all have your opportunity to tell me how wrong I am. But now on to something that's more important. We're coming up to my third year anniversary on YouTube with this channel. I'm really excited to be there, and that means it's time for my third anniversary tradition, where every year, coming around this time this year, on July 10th, I'm gonna be reviewing a record that came out one year ago, and that means in 2015. I'm going to be either a re-review of something that I might have already covered in 2015, you want me to readdress, or an album that I might have missed throughout the course of that year. Previously, I've covered Paramore's self-titled album, or I've covered Isaiah Rashad's Sylvia demo, so I'm genuinely curious what you guys would like me to cover from 2015. Now, what you guys can do is you can put your comments down below saying what you want me to cover here, and also keep in mind that I'm gonna be counting you guys, so if you span me across a number of different videos, I will know. I'm gonna be tallying the votes, and by roughly around the end of this week, I will have my full count. But I'm curious what you guys want me to say, and keep in mind, just don't give me crap. I, I just don't have the patience for it. Like, Sylvia demo last year, that was awesome. More of that. Um, till then, I'm Mark, you're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.